can I start with the introduction or would you like to start with prayer? You can start with the prayer, then you can introduce the speaker to us. Okay. Let us, friends, good evening to everyone. Um, as you can see, my name is Samson Gandhi for some of you joining us today. And uh, we have been engaged in a series of Bible study for the last five weeks on kingdom attitudes, how we should overcome wilderness attitudes by putting on the kingdom attitudes. We concluded that last week. And this week, we are going to do a very, very interesting topic, um, uh, which in a moment it will be um, introduced. And um, uh, we're going to do a survey of Old Testament. And um, <clears throat> that will be for this week. And next week, before we break for Christmas on 18th, there will be uh, the last Bible study, and we will do it on the uh, five questions that God asks in the book of Genesis. So that would be, a, again, a very interesting, thought-provoking Bible study. So let us pray, and then I will introduce to you the presenter of the Bible study this evening, Mr. Shem Chandran. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we praise you and thank you and worship you this evening. Our hearts are filled with gratitude for all that you do in our lives, even the gift of this time together to study your scripture. What a privilege and what a joy it is that Lord, the living word is in our hands. And here is the gifted anointed teacher who would bring your word in its vivid um, images and the purposes with which you have given us the word. So Lord, we pray that at the end of this Bible study, we will gain a greater appreciation of your word, a desire to read and study the word, and more importantly, to be able to follow and implement your word in our lives. To this end, we pray that you will bless our Bible study and our interaction. We thank you for St. Paul's Church and especially Reverend Concealan, who is pastoring this church. We give you thanks and praise. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit is given to each one of us so that we will understand and be touched by you during this time. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Friends, welcome. And uh, let me take this moment to um, introduce to you the um, Bible study teacher, presenter, Mr. Shem S. Chandran. He did Bachelor of Engineering in Electronics, Communication, and Electrical Economic uh, Communication and uh, um, uh, Electronics, Electrical Communication and Electronics at the Indian Institute of uh, Science, Bangalore, one of the most prestigious uh, institutes uh, in the world, Bangalore. And he won a gold medal in MTech in computer science at IIT Kharagpur. So he's not only an IIC graduate, but also an IIT graduate. He has worked with the Defense Research and Development Laboratory Okay, DRDL, Hyderabad. Uh, can you see all good things come from Hyderabad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for over 30 years, um, he was working there and was privileged to work with Dr. Abdul Kalam on Agni and Prithvi missiles. So he worked with our uh, president, our ex-president on these important projects. He's ardent about chess, and he represented the state of Karnataka in two national tournaments in chess. And he's passionate about disciple making, and he's been doing Bible studies with students in engineering and medical college hostels for over 40 years now. And let me tell you before I tell about your, his family, I myself was one of the students in my own college when I was doing my BCom. Uh, in Badruka College in Hyderabad. Um, me and three others 
benefited from his dedicated, committed Bible study he used to do. And the program that we followed was the Navigators program, Navigators Bible study program, which had a systematic study and scripture memory discipline. And uh, so I benefited a lot. And that's why I highly recommend it to pastor that Mr. Sham Chandran could be invited for this evening. And um, he's married to Dr. Priscilla. They have three children pursuing their studies in medicine and engineering. So let's welcome Mr. Shem Chandran uh, this evening to take the Bible study. Shem, yeah. over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, St. Paul's Church pastor and also Samson Gandhi. So without wasting more time, I'd like to go ahead. So what we'll be doing is the uh, overview of the Old Testament. This will be a more a historical and a geographical uh, presentation. Uh, I hope you can see this slide. Yes, sir. Yeah. If uh, uh, at any time my voice is lower, I request uh, uh, Samson to maybe alert me. All right. So what we're doing is part one. This come uh, is taking care of the law and the uh, history. Whereas part two on prophets and poetry, uh, I'm still preparing and I like to move forward. Now, why study the Old Testament? Actually, we think of the Bible as made up of two uh, testaments, old and new. Actually, it is one book, it's called the Redemption History or Salvation Story. It records God's purposes and action for his people. It is one message. And um, the, the Bible divides time into four epochs, creation, fall, redemption, which includes incarnation and consummation. As you can see, creation and fall are in the Old Testament and redemption and consummation in the New Testament. Now it's one continuous message. The Old Testament also reveals the Messiah uh, in Two ways. One in Shem. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. The Old Testament uh, re represents the Messiah in two ways. One is through what's called direct prophecies. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, in Luke twenty-four, Jesus said, "Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms." So uh, what he, Jesus said is almost the entire Old Testament was talking about him. The second way it reveals the Messiah is what is known as types. Types are what are called prototypes or shadows or prefigurements. Uh, these can be people, events, themes, and symbols in the Old Testament. And the ultimate fulfillment of it will be in, in Jesus. To give one example, say the sacrifices that we have in Leviticus on the animals, the bulls and goats, it, they actually point to the ultimate sacrifice that Christ made. So that is, uh, uh, so they were acting as types. Now let's, the by Old Testament also gives us the background and the context and uh, the history, culture. This is the scripture that Jesus and the apostles are used. In fact, when Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Uh, the scriptures that he's referring to is nothing but the Old Testament. And um, while the New Testament has a lot of didactic teachings, that is uh, teachings in say the epistles, in the Old Testament, we see most of the teaching is embodied through actual lives in real situations. So we see an Abraham, a Moses, a David, and so on. And we see all the teaching through these actual lives. And like all scriptures, Old Testament also reveals about God, his who he is, his character, his attitudes, plans, and purposes. 
and all the promises, the encouragement and the warnings. So these are exciting uh, reasons why we want to study the Old Testament. Now, the Hebrew Bible was divided into three parts, the Torah, Nabib and Ketuvim. And um, uh, the Torah is the law, the five books. And uh, uh, if you notice, number of books which we call uh, history, like Samuel, Judges, Kings, etc., they were grouped under prophets. Maybe they're the early prophets, and these are the later prophets. And uh, because Psalms was heading the, the, the list of the writings, sometimes the third section was called Psalms. That's why in Luke 24, uh, Jesus talked about law, prophets, and Psalms. Now, if you notice here, these books, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, so only one book each. In the third century BC, when they were uh, translating from the Hebrew to Greek um, to make the Septuagint uh, version, they found the Greek version became too long. So they divided these three books into two, two parts each, a practice which we continue. The Hebrew Bible also combined all the minor prophets into one book called the 12. They also combined Ezra and Nehemiah. Now in the English Bible, we have separated history and prophets. And so we have a, a Pentateuch. Tuke means uh, scrolls. So we have this, uh, the first five books, the history, uh, the poetry, and the prophets. Now in this uh, overview, we'll be covering the law and history. Now, let before we go further into the Bible, let's look at the world of the Old Testament. This is the world before Columbus. It's called the pre-Columbian world. This had only three continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And right in the middle of it, you see that red rectangle. That is where all the action of this Bible takes place. So let's grow that. And this is where civilization began. Now, what triggered civilization? The discovery of agriculture. Prior to that, people were nomad, hunters, gatherers, and they are always moving around with their flocks and herds looking for pasture. But once they discovered agriculture, they could settle down. And therefore, they had a lot of time and all the artifacts of civilization began. And this happened in all these river valleys. In fact, uh, historians tell us the five first cradles of civilization were Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means the land between Potamia is the waters. That is the land between Euphrates and Tigris. And this is in modern day Iraq. And the Nile Valley. And then the third one is our own indo gangetic plain. And there were two other cradles of civilization in China, the Yangtze Kiang and the Huang Ho. Huang Ho is also called the Yellow River. Now, this, uh, if you notice here, you may not be able to see in this map, you'll see the rivers, Euphrates, Tigris, the river Jordan going down to the uh, Dead Sea and the Nile. This area was very fertile. In fact, it was called the Fertile Crescent. So let's redraw this map and color it. So here is the Fertile Crescent and this is Mesopotamia. You have the rivers Euphrates and Tigris. I remember Tigris is on top because it starts with a T. And then you have this, uh, uh, you'll see Ur. This is the place where Abraham grew up and God called him. And um, somewhere here is a garden of Eden. We don't know exactly where, because these rivers, Euphrates and Tigris are mentioned in Genesis 2. Now, once the people were here, uh, they had a lot of time because of uh, growing the crops was not taking all that time and the crops they could store also. So they developed writing. In, in Mesopotamia, they developed what's called cuneiform writing. On clay tablets, they used to press a wedge-shaped characters. And uh, in the Nile Valley, they used to take the papyrus reeds which grow and stitch them together and did some uh, pictorial writing called hieroglyphics. So once they had writing, they developed a lot of other things like mathematics, 
they developed astronomy because they wanted to predict when the rivers will flood, they can plant their crops. Then they developed science, uh, wheel, law. <coughs> See the city here, Babylon, there was one great king called Hammurabi. He's one of the first persons who uh, proposed on two huge stone tablets, the law, it's called the Code of Hammurabi. This was discovered by a French archeologist and today it is lying in the Louvre Museum. And then they discovered art and then music. And then they learned to extract metals from the ground. Uh, the, one of the first metals they extracted was copper. You, you see this island here, Cyprus. Cyprus is very rich in copper. In fact, the name Cyprus comes from cuprus, which means copper. Then they started making alloys with zinc. They made brass for all the vessels, ornaments, etc. And then they had tin in Anatolia, that is uh, Turkey, and also in the Negev Desert in uh, Israel. And uh, th this alloy of copper with tin was a very strong bronze. And so the world got into the Bronze Age. In fact, the, the patriarchs, Abraham and all, they all lived during the Bronze Age. And then a little later, then they even started extracting iron. In fact, there's a group of people here called the Philistines. They originally came from Greece, from uh, island Crete, and they had brought the technology how to extract the, uh, iron. And in fact, we read in the book of Judges and all, the Philistines had iron chariots, and so they were very powerful. So this is the, the world, and right in the middle of this world is Jerusalem. In ancient drawings, they make, used to draw three uh, clover leaf uh, representing the three continents and right. So we have Jerusalem right at the center of the center of the then known world. Now let's come back to uh, the first section of the Old Testament. Genesis talks about creation. And you know the word there, scholars tell us the word used for creating universe, life, and man is uh, something which was not existing earlier. So God created a matter from nothing and he created a life from inanimate. And uh, then finally he created man with a soul and consciousness when there were no such things there. So, uh, and of course, the book talks about the origin of all God's people. Exodus, as you know, is the redemption from slavery in Egypt. It also covers the covenant that God made with them, the law he gave them, and the, the tabernacle that they used to worship at. Leviticus is the, uh, talks about the laws of worship, sacrifice, and peace. We'll go into these little later. Numbers is the wilderness wanderings, which you people have just done the Bible study in. And Deuteronomy is a Deutero, second giving of the Nomi law, because the first generation had died. We'll see a little later how. And so Moses was again giving the Ten Commandments and all the other messages just before they enter the land. In fact, you'll see the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and also in Deuteronomy 5. Now, uh, Genesis begins with a grand, in the beginning, God. And uh, it talks about uh, the uh, origin of family, nations. And the book divides into two sections. One to level is called the primeval history. It's because we don't, we can't uh, tell the dates exactly, but it, it records four great events, creation and fall, flood and the Tower of Babel, the scattering of the people. Now this, uh, these three, the theme is judgment. And uh, in fact, there's a very poignant verse in Genesis 6. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And so he decided to uh, destroy the people uh, in the flood. But then we saw, he saw that there's Noah and his family, he saved and brought them through the flood. 
Then later we will see again, the people spread out and then again they became evil and um, the God had to scatter them. Now, the uh, God's heart was filled with pain, not only because of the sin, but because also he had to judge them. In Ezekiel 33, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Genesis 12 to 50 talks about the patriarchal history. This covers about 250 years. And the four people it talks about are the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and one son, Joseph. And the theme is a promise of redemption. In fact, the first promise of redemption was immediately after the fall when God told Satan, the seed of the woman will crush your head. Now, this is a map I got from the Reader's Digest uh, uh, book, uh, the, the Land of the Bible. It's available free in, uh, in the internet uh, archive. And um, see, this is the ark. It has re rested on Mount Ararat in East Turkey. So after this flood, then these people started spreading out everywhere. They came down to Babel and this is where they built the tower. And so God said he would uh, uh, scatter them. The children of Shem, they went all over Asia to Persia, Syria, Israel, and Arabia. The children of Ham, they went more to Egypt. is, uh, sorry, more to Africa. Mizraim is Egypt, Kush is Ethiopia, Put is Libya and so on. And um, the children of Zaphat went north. They, uh, Tarshish in Spain, Ashkenaz in Germany, Javan in, in Greece, and a number of other places. So this is where the people spread out. And um, some scholars try to identify the major races of your human beings the Caucasian, the uh, Negroid, and Mongoloid, etc. But uh, not all scholars accept that. So uh, now we'll uh, come back to uh, Abraham. The, you know, Abraham was living in Ur. See, God is beginning again and again. After Noah, uh, we saw that the people had to be scattered and judged. But so again, God, this time, he said to Abraham, leave your country your people and your father's household and go to the land i will show you i will bless you and make you a great nation and all people on earth will be blessed through you now this is a very fundamental uh, promise that god made which is quoted in the new testament and so we see that abraham along with his father terah wife sarai and nephew lot they came up to haran in Syria and their terror died and then they continued down into Canaan as the Lord led them. Now sometime later there was some famine here. Now because Abraham had a lot, lot of flocks and herds with his family he went down to Egypt and you know what happened. So one of the questions we normally ask is why did uh, Abraham is a man of faith can't he trust in God why did he tell a lie about his wife but um, the question that we should ask is, what is the author's message through this incident? See, Moses is going to talk to the Israelites in Egypt, and he's going to tell them, God's going to bring you out. Your ancestor Abraham, he also had to go down to Egypt because of famine, just like Jacob and the 12 tribes went down. And there was some trouble with Pharaoh, but God brought Abraham out and his family safely. He will do the same with you. So Moses wants to talk to the Israelites, quoting Abraham's experience. Now, uh, about Abraham, the four things that I wanted to say. He believed God. And uh, even when he had no children, God showed him all the stars. And he said, your children will be like the sand of the seashore. And he believed God. And that's why he's called the father of those who walk in faith. Now, uh, God made a covenant with him. He said, I will bless you. And normally we think when God blesses a person, 
he can heal our material wealth, health, and so on. But actually what God said is, when I bless you, you will be a blessing. Now that is the way God will bless each one of us. And he said, all people on earth will be blessed through you. In Abraham's case, this came through through a seed, and namely Jesus. This is again quoted in um, uh, by Paul and others. Now there was an incident when uh, Abraham was pleading for Sodom. Why I put this up is, you see how he pleads. He pleads uh, praise on, based on God's character. He said, you are the judge of all the earth. How could you, how can you destroy all the people? There may be a lot of righteous people too. Far be it from you, Lord. And you know how Abraham uh, kept on bargaining with God, but finally even they could not find 10 righteous people. Now, Abraham made a very uh, prophetic statement. In Genesis 22, God had told him to offer up Isaac. So as they were walking along, Isaac asked uh, Abraham, uh, Father, where is the lamb? And he said, God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. They were going to the Mount Moriah, where God had told him to uh, sacrifice Isaac. Now the Mount Moriah is the older name of the same Mount um, in Jerusalem. And um, true, God provided the ram as a substitute for Isaac. But, um, but to the 2000 years later, another father was sacrificing another son on the same mountain. And this time the sacrifice was not stopped. And God had provided the lamb for the sacrifice, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Now, the other three uh, the people I wanted to talk about, the, I mean, the, from John Stutt, I got this title, how God revealed himself in the life of Isaac, that he's a God of promise. Isaac is often called the valley between two hills. Jacob, you know what kind of a person Jacob was. So God really had to persevere with him. Now, there are two events in Jacob's life. The first event is Bethel, when he left his parents and he was going north. Um, at Bethel, he had this dream of a ladder or a staircase going to heaven. And he made the first meeting with God. In fact, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. But then after that, uh, I say, uh, Jacob continued to go his own way. And then finally, when he was running uh, from Laban, and he was scared of meeting his brother Esau, he came to a place Peniel where he wrestled with an angel of the Lord. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he says, I saw God face to face and my life was spared. Now a lot of scholars feel that in a typical way, believers also have two experiences with God. But one is a better where we first come to recognize Christ as a savior and invite him into our first uh, uh, meeting with Christ. But then later on, we continue to go our own way. There needs to come to another time, a perennial in our life, when we will make a deeper commitment uh, to follow the Lord. Now, Joseph is a God of providence. Now, well, one of the things that characterized Joseph was his reverence for God. When Potiphar's wife, uh, uh, tempted him. He said, how could I do this great sin against God? Now, the next two uh, references in Genesis 45 and 50, I included here just to illustrate a principle of God's sovereignty. We often think of God's sovereignty is that God is the one who does all the, uh, everything that happens. Now, there's a danger in thinking that because God cannot be an uh, author of evil. In fact, God didn't make uh, the brothers sell uh, Joseph. They sold Joseph out of the envy in their hearts. Potiphar's wife uh, accused Joseph wrongly because of the evil in her heart. Um, God didn't do that. God didn't. Uh, but on the other hand, even though all these people acted of their own free will, in some mysterious way, this entire thing happened and this was God's will. And that's why uh, Joseph could say after he 
reconciled with his brothers. You sold me. God sent me. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So we can see a sort of a dual authorship of some of these uh, events. Now, let's look at the timeline. I already mentioned civilization started about 3000 BC when they had writing and astronomy. So prior to that, we cannot make these dates very clearly. So we cannot give these dates for creation, Adam, Noah and the flood. But later on, uh, the dates are more, uh, uh, more certain. Abraham was about 2000 BC. So there is, I told you this is a historical geographical presentation. You must fix these dates within you. Abraham is about 2000 BC. And then after that, the Exodus, there are two dates given. One is called the early date, 1440 BC, based on some scriptures. In Exodus 12, it says, at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's division left Egypt. So that will work out to about 1440. And then also in 1 Kings, it says, in the 480th year, after the Israelites came out of Egypt, Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord. We know Solomon began to build the temple around 95 BC, and so uh, 950 BC, and so that would make uh, the date of uh, Exodus 1440. But uh, some scholars, based on archaeological evidence, they think the date is more 1250. Uh, this is called the later date. Now, we said this is more a historical geographical overview. You should be aware of some of the kingdoms. The first world empire that was there was Egypt. I mean, this is the Fertile Crescent. There were small kingdoms, the Sumerians and all that. But this was a world empire. Now, the first pharaoh, King Menes, around 3100 BC, he united all the city-states, Thebes, Memphis, etc. And then uh, they started ruling. There were about 170 pharaohs and 31 dynasties. The pyramids were about 2500 BC. We already said Abraham came down here around 2000 BC. Now, there were some people from Palestine. Uh, they had come and conquered uh, Egypt. And so we have uh, uh, some pharaohs called the Hyksos. So they were around 1650 BC. Maybe these were the pharaohs who were more friendly to the Israelites at the time of Joseph and so on, and Joseph's children. But then later, uh, the other pharaohs came up from Egypt and who threw this Hyksos out. And, uh, and so you read in Exodus, some hostile pharaohs came up. In, if we accept the early date, 1440, for Exodus, the Pharaoh is Tutmos. If we accept the late date, then the Pharaoh is Ramses. Now, Exodus, the key person is Moses. Now, there are many events in Moses' life. I just want to say when God wanted to recruit Moses, he was very reluctant. He made all kinds of excuses that he could not talk, etc. When God answered all that, finally Moses said, Lord, please send someone else. And God's anger burned against Moses. Now, there are two events. One is in Exodus 32, when these people were making the golden calf. And Numbers 14, you'll see later, when these people rebelled and refused to go forward. Uh, God wanted to destroy the, all the Israelites. And he told Moses, I will destroy them and make you into a great nation. But Moses would not accept that. He again pleaded with God based on, uh, again, these criteria. One, Lord, remember your promises. You made the promises to the patriarchs. And then uh, based on God's character, you are a forgiving God, slow to anger. Lord, please forgive these people. And then based on God's glory, what will the nation say? That you're not able to take them further and that's why you destroy them. So God listened to Moses and he did not destroy them. And then, one, but one of the greatest prayers that Moses made, which really challenges all of us is, Lord, show me your glory. We normally pray, Lord, show us your grace and mercy. But here's this person asking God to show him glory. 
Now, we think of Exodus as a redemption from slavery. But this is not how God sees it. When God was making covenant with the Israelites on Mount Sinai, he said, I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. That is Exodus. God bringing them to himself. Now, we also should not think of, uh, because our salvation is uh, like a, this Exodus is like a type of our salvation. We also should not think of our salvation as merely redemption from sin and from sin's penalty, though it includes all that. But more than everything, that God is bringing us to himself in Christ. Now, God made a covenant and law. He said, I'll be your God and you'll be my people and you'll follow. We'll look at these things later, covenant and law. And they also... Uh, God said, make a sanctuary for me and I'll dwell among the people. Now let's look at the map, the root of Exodus. This is Goshen, where the Israelites are staying. So they started uh, coming out after they crossed the Red Sea. Uh, these are these black circles with numbers are the places where they camped. And so they came down to Mount Sinai and they rested here for about a year. This is when God, um, I mean, Moses went up to the Sinai and, and God gave him the law. God told him, make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among the people. See, God's purpose is to dwell among his people. He made us in his image. And um, uh, so this is where he began, make a sanctuary for me. Now, uh, the tabernacle, in fact, uh, the two two elements of it. One is the courtyard, and then there's this bronze altar for all the sacrifices that they, and then there were basins for washing and all. And then this is the tent. The tent had a, a lot of furniture inside it. The most important was the Ark of the Covenant. And you see two cherubims, and the covering of the Ark is called the mercy seat. This is where the high priest would go in, inside this Holy of Holies, on into this where this uh, uh, ark was and uh, make sacrifice uh, once a year called Yom Kippur. And then there are other things that for other furniture and that for the table is a, a lampstand, the menorah, and then the altar of incense. And then there were the priestly garments also. In fact, the in the ephod you had to have these twelve stones. Um, representing the 12 tribes. Now, the next book, Leviticus, deals with the law. Now, we go to two extremes about the law. Uh, one extreme is called um, legalism. We say this law is God's, uh, God had given this law, it is his desire, and therefore we must keep it. So, like for instance, the uh, law to keep the Sabbath. Some people be very meticulous in that. And, but then the other extreme is people say anti, is antinomianism. Antinomianism means there is no law. Aren't we liberated from the law? Christ has liberated and so there is no law. So what is the right attitude we should have to the law? Now, it was uh, Thomas Aquinas in, th in 13th century BC, AD, <coughs> who studied this a law and grouped it under three headings. The ceremonial law of sacrifices, priests and festivals, and the moral law and the civil law. Now the ceremonial law uh, about sacrifices and priests, we see Paul writing later in 1 Corinthians, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed because Christ has met all these requirements of all the ceremonial laws. Uh, he is a great high priest. And so he is the ultimate sacrifice. So we don't have to make any sacrifices today. And then the next, the uh, moral law is based on God's character. God said, you shall be holy because I am holy. And because this is God's character and we, have, we want to have a living relationship with God. So the moral law that includes the Ten Commandments, and number of other laws, uh, these are all totally binding on us. 
In fact, all those laws are repeated in the New Testament. The third uh, group of laws is the civil law, the social and cultural laws. In fact, there are even some laws of cleanliness and etc. Because you must remember, these people are not, uh, slaves for 400 years in Egypt and they don't know how to live in a community. So they just come out and so on. Now, the Israelites had their own social and cultural laws, which was binding on them. Now, we have our own social and cultural laws, which are binding on us. So that is the way, uh, way we now re uh, react to this law. Now, coming to sacrifices, what do the sacrifices really say? They, uh, what the book of Leviticus says is the way to the holy God is through uh, sacrifice, through repentance and forgiveness. Now, but in Hebrews 9, we read, um, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And that's why these animal sacrifices were given. But Hebrews 10 says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Then why did God give these animal sacrifices? See, these sacrifices, animal sacrifices which they uh, made, were actually pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice that Christ would make. And so they were forgiven on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, which would take place in the future. Just like we are forgiven based on Christ's perfect sacrifice, which took place in the past. And so, that is, uh, uh, that is how they were forgiven. Priesthood. We know also the book of uh, Hebrews tells us Jesus is a great high priest. But uh, um, uh, God had told uh, the Israelites, I have taken the Levites in place of the first male offspring. But then later on, uh, in Deuteronomy, um, Moses tells the people, you shall be a kingdom of peace unto me. Peter picks this up in 1 Peter when he calls the church, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So we have a priestly function of intercession. Now coming to the festivals, there are a number of festivals. The main three festivals were the Passover, Pentecost and Tab Tabernacles. Now let's move on to numbers. Now numbers is a uh, they took a census, the preparation for the journey. This is the wilderness experience. It's a type of Christian's journey. After we come to Christ, we go through a lot of trials and uh, temptations and uh, difficulties. Now, these people suffered, grumbled a lot. And Paul says, these things are written as examples for us, not to set heart on evil and be faithless. So let's continue the journey of these Israelites. They went down to Ezan Giva, and this is Akaba, with the Gulf of Akaba, and came to Kadesh Banya. In two weeks, they came from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Banya. And now this is where this, uh, they can enter into the promised land. But then this, uh, they sent 12 spies. Uh, the spies brought back good um, report about the land. But 10 of the spies said, oh, these people are big, giants and all. Um, they will destroy us. Two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua said, no, no, let's go. God has promised this land through Abraham. He will uh, give it to us. Now these people are foolish. See, these people here, they're all city-states like Jericho, Hebron and all that. And they're not one big united people. In fact, there are a number of Canaanites, um, the Jebusites and uh, Amalekites and all sorts of number of different people were there. But uh, the, whereas the Hebrews, they are one big people and these people are scared of them because they heard what God had done to Egypt. Egypt was the world top uh, empire and how God had uh, brought about all these plagues and finally he allowed these people to come out. These people were in terror of the Israelites. That you remember in Jericho, in the book of Joshua, we read this uh, woman, Rahab, she tells these two spies, all of us are in terror of these people. They failed to realize this. Instead, they, they had 
what's called the grasshopper mentality that these people are all giants and so uh, they refused to go they wanted to stone moses and return to egypt so this is the second time god wanted to destroy the people but then because moses pleaded he said not one of those who saw my glory and the signs i performed in egypt and in the wilderness but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to the ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. So what happened? Therefore, these people started wandering here in this desert wilderness Zin for 40 years till all these people, the whole old generation died uh, except to Joshua and Caleb. And then uh, with the new generation, they once more started proceeding. Now they're going on the east of the uh, this valley and the river Jordan. They are at Mount Hor. Uh, Aaron died, he was buried there. At Mount Nebo, um, Moses died, he was buried there. You see, they also crossed a lot of lands, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Now they are related. Edom is uh, uh, Jacob's brother, Esau. And Moab and Ammon are in, um, Lot's uh, children. And so God did not give those lands to the Israelites. They, uh, they had to bypass those lands and go. And then finally, uh, they entered. Uh, so we see uh, in Numbers, uh, I'll just go to that. They, they had a second census. Because of these two census, uh, this book is called Numbers. Now, Deuteronomy is the second law. Because you saw the first generation had died, so uh, Moses had to give them again the new, uh, to the new generation of law. And what Moses said is, it's not because you're numerous, but because God loves you. God did not set his love on you because of anything great about you. And God has been faithful. And so Deuteronomy is called the book of the covenant. Typically, it has what's called blessings. If you keep his covenant, uh, faithful to obey his commandments. And, but on the other hand, if they forsake, go off into idolatry, etc., there were a lot of curses. Now, in a typical fashion, Moses told them when they go back to the, uh, into the land of Israel, half the tribes, well, uh, half the Levites must go to Mount Ebal and pronounce all the curses if they uh, disobey God. And the other half will go to Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And there they will recite all the blessings if they keep the law. So, um, uh, obedience is actually proof of love. Now let's look at the history books. The books are divided into three parts. Early history is Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Monarchy is the uh, books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. And the exile and return are Ezra and Amaya and Esther. Now, coming to Joshua, uh, Joshua, the young person, he was worried. How can he take the place of Moses? But God said, be strong and courageous. And he told him, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, that you'll be careful to obey all that's written in it. Then you'll be uh, successful and, have, and be prosperous. So, uh, this is the land and uh, you see the people coming from here they first conquered some of the, uh, the uh, other people like og and bashan the amalekites not the ammonites or uh, moabites because uh, god didn't give that land to them and then after that they entered jericho and they conquered then they came down south See, I told you these are all city-states. Then they conquer all these small, small city-states in the south. Then they, then they uh, went up north and conquered all the city-states in the north. So this is how Joshua took the entire land. But the task was unfinished. There's still large areas of land to be taken over. Now what really <coughs> characterized Joshua was his commitment. We see towards the end of his life, he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
Now Joshua made one mistake. See, Moses <coughs> had raised up a uh, successor, Joshua. Later on, we'll see Elijah had Elisha. Jesus had his 12. And um, Paul had trained up Timothy and Titus. So it's a good principle to train your successors. Now, because Joshua did not train another leader, you'll see all the problems that took place in the next book, in the book of Judges. But before we go to it, the second half of Joshua is division of this land. So they divided this land by lots, and also according to the size of the stripes. So you see the list of all the tribes. And uh, if you see, uh, two names will not be here. One is Levi, because God had taken them as uh, to serve him in the temple and the tabernacle. And uh, they were given lots everywhere, and they were to be supported by tithes from the other tribes. The other name you will not see here is Joseph, because what happened, Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, um, Ephraim, Ephraim and Manasseh, they were adopted by uh, Jacob as his sons. And uh, so they are now counted as part of the 12 tribes. And um, so in one sense, Joseph, see, Jacob's, in Jacob's mind, Rachel was the wife he loved. The others he married, but uh, and therefore he considered Joseph as his firstborn, even though he's only the eleventh son. But and therefore we see his firstborn Joseph got a double portion of the land. Now let's come to the judges. But the key principle is there was no leader, and because there was no leader, everyone did, uh, and so Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So they went into sin, into idolatry. And so what God did, God uh, sent them into slavery and is as part of his judgment. You see, when other, uh, uh, other kingdoms, uh, they lose a battle against Israel, they will say their gods are more powerful than our gods. But Israel will never say that because they're mon they're, they believe in a monotheism. So they will, if they lose a battle, they say, the Lord has judged us. The Lord has sold us into the hand of the enemies. So once these people are in slavery, then they cry out to God. So we see there's a supplication. And then God sends a savior, uh, a deliverer called a judge. Judge, not in a legal sense, but uh, more as, uh, a le uh, as a governor, etc. And then we see uh, as long as the leader was there, there was peace in the land and for some more years after that. But after he died, <coughs> we again returned to sin. Now this cycle, sin, slavery, supplication, savior, silence, this goes on again and again and again in the book of Judges. In fact, uh, uh, see, uh, the Othniel was the first judge. He's actually Caleb's nephew. Uh, the Mesopotamian kings had conquered them. They ruled over them for eight years. And then Othniel delivered them and then the land had peace for 40 years. Then Ehud delivered them from Moabites. And then Deborah, the prophetess, and Barak <coughs> then delivered them from some Canaanite kings. And they had peace for 40 years. Gideon de uh, uh, delivered them from the Midianites. And then Jephthah from the Ammonites. And then Samson from the Philistines. In fact, there are a number. Uh, there are almost fourteen judges in this book we talk about. These are the uh, judges who much, much has been written. The others, very very little verses uh, talk about them. But the key principle is repeated in the book of Judges and right to the end. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Now this takes us to another small book, Ruth. People talk about Ruth as a lily between, I mean, it's two big uh, uh, giants. That is the book of Judges and the book of Kings. Um, now, uh, you know the story of Ruth. We will not take time into it. Um, Naomi and Elimelech husband, they leave Bethlehem because of famine. They go down to Moab. 
and then there the sons also marry there two Moabites and then Elimelech dies and the two sons also die Malan and Kilian and so they then they found the famine when uh, was over in Bethlehem so they returned and so she told them don't call me Naomi Naomi means pleasant call me Mara Mara means bitter I went away full the Lord has brought me back empty then we uh, she told the two daughter-in-laws to go back but Ruth said no where you go I will go and where you stay I will stay your people will be my people your God will be my God it's almost like the marriage covenant the bride and groom will say to each other um, now so we see Ruth is gleaning in the field of Boaz now Boaz is a, a relative of Naomi and he uh, meets with uh, Ruth and says may you be richly rewarded uh, because he had heard about how she is taking care of her mother-in-law and then later on we uh, events are there where Boaz marries Ruth and uh, so pe the people will tell Naomi your daughter-in-law who loves you is better than seven sons now what is all the story about what is the main message of this of this book there's a principle called kinsman redeemer in Israel if one Israelite uh, gets into problem a close kinsman um, relative is supposed to redeem him now that is how Boaz is the kinsman redeemer uh, redeems uh, Naomi and Ruth and um, now in our case the book of Hebrews says both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family so Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters so in one sense Jesus is our kinsman redeemer so that's what illustrated in the book of Ruth now let's come to the monarchical history the books of Samuel talk about transition see uh, up to Samuel or the judges they were all people who listened to God so God ruling the kingdom is called theocracy then they came to Samuel and said we want a king like all other nations and so finally um, they raised a king uh, Samuel so we uh, Saul so we see a transition from Samuel to Saul but then Saul is not the right king and we see a transition again to David now the book of Kings is actually a tale of two kingdoms the kingdom divides after Solomon we'll see this a little later and um, so the the two great prophets at this time Elijah and Elisha and the northern kingdom they went into exile to Assyria and the Judah the southern kingdom went into exile in Babylon a thousand years later we'll look at this later. now Chronicles is repeating this entire history in fact it goes all the way back to uh, Adam the genealogy of Adam and all the 12 tribes and it, uh, one chronicles about David two chronicles about Solomon and the divided kingdom and up till the uh, exile of Judah now so now let's look at very briefly Saul uh, see where when the people told Samuel he was a king God told Samuel it is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king and uh, but then later on we see there are a number of times Saul was disobedient and uh, at one time he was uh, told to kill, kill completely all the animals and all that but he spared all those animals and then he said no no I spared this for burnt offerings so Samuel says there's a Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the voice of the Lord to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. so God rejects Saul and uh, now uh, we see uh, Saul will become jealous of David because the people are singing Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousand he tries to kill him a number of times there are a number of times David could have killed Saul but David's response was I will not lift my hand against the Lord's anointing because he recognized 
that Saul is an anointed king. Now come to David. Now there are like two points about David which really I want to highlight. One is his heart. Even at the time of uh, uh, choosing him, Samuel himself was uh, thinking about uh, uh, choosing the other sons, Eliab, or, or because they were tall and well built. And God said, no, uh, God looks at the heart. And I said later in Acts, we see uh, Peter saying, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man of my own heart, of fulfilled all my will. Now, the second big thing about David was his um, reverence for God. We already saw that he will not kill Saul because Saul is God's anointed. And uh, so, in fact, when Goliath came to him, he told him, you come against me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, whom you have defied. And uh, now there are two unfortunate incidents of sin. One is uh, Bathsheba. But then after Nathan the prophet come to him, he, this is a beautiful psalm, Psalm 51, he repents and he tells God, against you, you only have I sinned. Now, didn't David sin against Bathsheba, against her husband Uriah, got him killed? No, but he says, uh, because all sin is ultimately against God. And then secondly, when he was counting all the uh, armed men, whom we are not supposed to. Uh, so God's wrath was again judgment on him. And finally, uh, God gave him a way to build a sacrifice. This was on the mount uh, the, where the te current temple is built. And um, so, um, but uh, when Ab Ab Abinan gave him the land and said, please take it, he said, no, I will not offer sacrifices to the Lord that cost me nothing. So we see uh, David's reverence for God, his heart for God and his reverence for God. Now, God made a lot of covenants. Covenant is a contract, terms and conditions, blessings, curses, etc. Now, the first covenant was the Abrahamic covenant. And then God extended this covenant at Sinai with the people of Israel. He said, I'll be your God and you will be my people. That is what covenant is. And then the, there's another qualification in 2 Samuel 7, a very important chapter where God told David, your house and your kingdom will endure forever. Your throne will be established forever. In fact, with all the promises of the Messiah, that he will be the uh, uh, eternal ruler come from this promise. Now, um, in the book of Jeremiah 31, God said, told the people through the prophet, I will make a new covenant. It will not be like the old covenant. The problem with the old covenant was these people were not able to keep the laws. But instead it says, I'll put my law in their minds and I will uh, write it on your hearts. A parallel passage in Ezekiel 36 says, I'll give you a new heart. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to follow me. So this is the new covenant. But actually, God made the new covenant finally through Christ. In fact, in the upper room, Jesus uh, inaugurated this covenant. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood ordered for you. So we are now part of this new covenant. Solomon, um, when God told him, what oh, do you want? He, uh, he asked for a discerning heart. He, uh, so. Uh, he said, I'll give you a wise discerning heart, riches and honor and long life to walk in my ways. Now, this map is showing you the central uh, area in purple is Saul's kingdom. That is uh, Israel at the time of Saul. But then after Saul, David and Solomon, mainly David, extended this kingdom into much larger. A lot of Edom and Moab and Ammon. Because these people started fighting against the Israelites. Now God gave those lands also to them and Philistines and so all. So this uh, Solomon married many foreign women and he built temples for their idols. In fact, he did evil by even worshipping those idols. So God was very angry 
In fact, uh, he wanted to destroy Solomon. He wanted to take away the kingdom. But he said, for David's sake, I will not take it away in Solomon's time. So I will do it from his son's time. And so uh, that happened, you'll see in the next slide. Um, somebody summarized the three kings. These are the three kings of the monarchy of the combined kingdom. Saul had no heart for God. David was a man after God's heart. Solomon had a divided heart for God. Now, the Solomon, when God came to him, he told him, um, you were blessed my father because he had a completely committed heart to you. In fact, David used to pray in Psalm 86, give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. So my question was, when God asked him, what do you want? Instead of asking for wisdom, if he had asked for such a heart, do you think God would have given him such a wise heart? I mean, such a heart along with the wisdom and the riches and honor and long life, which he didn't ask. And then this, this uh, history of Israel would have been so different. Now, Solomon built this temple and uh, he told, he, when he prayed, the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple? The temple was built in the pattern of the tabernacle. So you have the holy place and the holy of holies, the bronze altar, etc. <clears throat> now, and then the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, in one slide, I wanted to keep all the kings and the major prophets. So these are the three kings of the United Kingdom. Now, David is around 1000 BC. So you want to hang on to some dates. You saw that uh, Abraham was 2000 BC. David is 1000 BC. And then at the time of uh, Rehoboam, uh, the kingdoms uh, divided into the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And these are the kings. Some of the good kings are in blue and some of the kings who are mostly evil were in black. And uh, there are a number of prophets. God raised up very powerful prophets at the time of the greatest trouble. At the time of Ahab, one of the most wickedest king, uh, God uh, raised up uh, Elijah. And uh, now, uh, then again, when uh, Assyria was in uh, the ruling power and they were, uh, they had conquered the northern kingdom and taken them into exile, God raised up Isaiah as a great prophet who protected the southern kingdom, who could uh, counsel Hezekiah and others against Assyria. Then, but uh, in the end, uh, when the Babylonians were invading, God raised up a great prophet, Jeremiah, but he was not able to prevent them. He, he told his people, you listen to God, submit to this, uh, 70 years of exile, but they refused to just listen. Some of these kings were mostly good, but sometimes they were also bad uh, in the end. For instance, Asa was a good king. He did a lot of good things. But then when Assyria and the northern kingdom attacked uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, he took all the uh, treasures, treasures from the temple and sent it uh, sorry, he sent it to Assyria, when the northern kingdom and, uh, and Syria attacked. He sent it to Assyria to come and attack the northern kingdom. Now the prophet that time was Jehu. He came and scolded them and he said that that was wrong. And because of that, we see Assyria gets, uh, uh, comes into this northern kingdom. And then Jehoshaphat was a very good king. At one time, there were three kingdoms, um, Edom, Moab, and Ammon were fighting, but he trusted God. But then he made some bad alliances. The king in Israel was Ahab, the northern kingdom. He took their daughter, Ataliah, and married to his son. And she was a wicked queen who tried to kill all the children and take over the kingdom. And then we see Uzziah was a very good king, but then towards the end, he became very proud. And at one time he marched into the temple. He wanted to burn the incense and all. The priest ran after him and said, Uzziah, it's not for you. But he refused to listen. And finally, God struck him down with leprosy. Hezekiah is one of the best kings. But then uh, towards the end, he became a little proud. 
when some envoys came from Babylon, he took them and showed them all the treasuries in the temple and all. Uh, Isaiah came and scolded him and said, because of this, uh, Babylon will conquer them. Uh, and, um, Manasseh was one of the worst kings. And um, in fact, it is uh, the tradition says Manasseh killed Isaiah by sawing him into two. But then the one of the uh, surprising things is when Manasseh was being taken as a captive to Syria, uh, he prayed and wept and uh, and he um, repented. Earlier he had put all idols and all in the temple. Then so God allowed Manasseh to come back and restore him. And then he removed all the idols and Manasseh changed. Uh, you know why I put that is, I mean, it's the greatness of God who can move, who can forgive a person like Manasseh who did such evil because he came back to him in the end. So uh, these are the, then finally, the Northern Kingdom was exiled in 721. So here is another date, like 2000 Abraham, 1000 David, 721, the Northern Kingdom went into exile. And in 586, the Southern Kingdom went into exile to Babylon, the time of Zedekiah. And of course they returned in 538. Now, uh, this is a very uh, briefly uh, showing the, the divided kingdom, the, the 10 tribes, and here the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The capital was Samaria, Jerusalem. There are 19 kings, the 19 kings and one queen. The kings of uh, Judah were mostly descendants of David. But here you had all kinds of kings, and uh, so they led them into idolatry. Now, I told you about the world empires. Uh, we already saw Egypt as the first world empire. The second world empire was Assyria. Their capital was Nineveh, all of uh, Babylon, all of Mesopotamia, and down uh, up to Egypt, they had conquered. Now, uh, <coughs> God used Assyria as the rod of his anger, the club of his wrath, to <coughs> come and punish the, the northern kingdom. But uh, Assyrians, they started uh, boasting that by the strength of my hand, I've done this. And so God said, therefore, I will deal with him after I judge my people. So you see, God can use other nations to come and judge. In fact, later on, God is using Babylon to come and judge the southern kingdom. So uh, there were a number of de uh, deportations. These are some names of top uh, kings. There was one king, Sennacherib. He came and attacked Jerusalem. And he wrote a big letter saying, on whom are you depending? Your God cannot save you. So Hezekiah was the king. He took that letter into the temple, laid it on the altar and prayed. Then Isaiah sent word to Sennacherib, don't worry, it won't happen. So that night, uh, Sennacherib heard people were attacking his uh, native place. So he uh, and his army went back. And when he reached Nineveh, he was murdered by his own sons. So that's the Assyrian kingdom. They were conquered by the next world empire, the Babylonian king. And this is the Babylonian uh, empire. So they conquered all of Assyria. And uh, they conquered a number of other lands. They, uh, and there were a number of exiles. The, uh, the, when they came to the southern kingdom. In 605, in the first exile, people like Daniel and others were taken. In 597, the second exile, people like Ezekiel and all were taken, exiled into Babylon. And the, in the 586, the final exile, Zedekiah, the um, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was burnt. Now, then uh, after uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the great other king was, Belshazzar, and then during his time, Darius the Mede, these the Persians, they conquered Babylon, and so the Babylonian Empire came, uh, was conquered. Persia is the third great king kingdom, so you see um, their capital was here, um, and um, the, um, they conquered, they conquered Babylon in 539, 
the king was Cyrus. And um, see, in 538, Cyrus said, this is repeated in 2 Chronicles and Ezra, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem, build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, may their God be with them. So he allowed the people to go back. And so uh, the first uh, return from exile was under Zerubbabel, he's the governor there. And when they came back, they started rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem at 537. The two prophets were Haggai and Zechariah. And then the next, uh, his son, Cambyses, he conquered Egypt. And then his son was Darius. And in Darius' time, he, al uh, he allowed uh, uh, um, both uh, Ezra and Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem. I know why I didn't write it there. Okay, that's coming here. Sorry, it's not Zerus's time. At Atta Zerus's time, he allowed Ezra and Nehemiah. So these are two more uh, groups of uh, return from exile. And Esther was a queen here and at, Sus uh, at Susa. Her husband was Xerxes. We'll see briefly about Esther later. So um, finally, uh, Artaxerxes, uh, Darius III was the last king and he and Persia falls to Alexander in 334. Now, by this time, it uh, moves on into um, the prophets. In fact, all these kingdoms are talked about in Daniel. So when you look at Daniel, you'll see them. Now, here's the return from exile. First time uh, under King Cyrus, Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, and they started rebuilding the temple. At the time of Xerxes, uh, there was a lot of opposition, the, uh, the work was stopped. But then Darius allowed the uh, people to continue and then the temple was completed. And then the Atazas' time, Ezra and Nehemiah uh, returned. There's a great spiritual revival. Nehemiah was in, you know, instrumental rebuilding the wall. Now, what are some of the lessons from exile? See, God is sovereign over history. He moves kings. We already saw he moved uh, uh, Cyrus to allow these people to return. And the, these people learned a lot of lessons. One of the lessons is monotheism. You know, before this, the Israelites used to get into idolatry and all. But historians say, after this exile, after they returned, they never went back to idolatry. Oh, um, then, because they were away from the temple was not there, their synagogue culture started. They built a lot of synagogues. And then the scriptures were revised. In fact, you know, a lot of it was done by Ezra and later by Nehemiah. Uh, Ezra is a scribe. So they uh, completed the scriptures. And also there were a lot of groups of people. Well, one group of the Pharisees. They took a vow, a uh, quote, we will obey all the laws strictly. And uh, then you saw they went overboard at the time of Jesus and they used to persecute Jesus. Another lesson is God raises individuals to do his will. In the next slide, we'll see three individuals. But these leaders must be devoted, prayerful, faithful, and diligent. So we see Ezra. Ezra set his heart to study God's law, obey, and teach it. And in fact, he brought about a great uh, uh, spiritual revival. We read, uh, he told these people uh, not to get into this mixed marriages. It's because of such like, because of like these, King Solomon went into sin. <clears throat> so Nehemiah, when he heard about his Jerusalem's ruin, he wept and prayed. And then uh, the Arthasus allowed him to come back. So he came back. And the first thing is very meticulous and planning. Nehemiah is a great topic for Christian um, um, management people. They talk about a number of his good qualities. And he motivated these people. The God of heaven will give us success. We will rebuild. He was a man of prayer. And then he faced a lot of opposition. At one time, they had to do their work with the 
on one hand and hold a weapon in the other. And the most miraculous, the, uh, they rebuilt the wall in 52 days. And Nehemiah attributed all this to God. The good hand of the Lord was upon me. So this is Esther. Uh, we see a lot of uh, events here where we see God's sovereignty. Esther was made queen in place of Vashti. And Esther's cousin, Mordecai, and he discovered a plot of a Haman who wanted to destroy all these um, Israelites on a particular day. So he asked Esther to go to the king. And now it was, now she's not supposed to go. If she goes there, she will die. Uh, and if, and uh, invited if she goes to the king. So, but as uh, Mordecai said, if you remain silent, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So finally, Esther becomes bold and she walks into the king's chamber saying, if I perish, I perish. Now that's the end. Uh, what's the message of the history books? We already saw that God is sovereign. There's a linear fulfillment. It is not random or cyclical. Now the Bible, though it's not a history book, we see it corresponds to history, archaeology, and many of the things we saw in this uh, the historical geographical background. Now God is sovereign over all the nations. He's the one who raises kings, brings down kings. This is what Daniel says. He judges them. He uses them as instruments of justice. And his ultimate goal is to bless the nations. And this is what Daniel says. He deposes kings, raises up others. And Romans 13 says, there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against his authority is rebelling against God, against what God has instituted. And the, the important things in God's dealing with the, the people of Israel is covenant. Covenant with the Israel, the covenant from Abraham extended, and the covenant with David about the eternal king. And uh, God is also sovereign over individuals. We just saw in the previous slide how he chooses and empowers people. And I conclude this with one verse which challenges me every time. In 2 Chronicles 69 it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So this is the... Um, close this. Oh. Over to you, Samson. <laughs> Thank you, Sham. Uh, you packed so much into these uh, one hour, 20 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, storehouse of treasure and I'm sure um, as we were watching your presentation a lot of questions would have come to our mind and I would throw it open to all the uh, members of St. Paul's and other friends who joined this Bible study. Uh, if you have any questions uh, based on the presentation uh, I'm sure Shem would be very happy to address them over to uh, open the floor is open for questions. Mm. Any questions? Oh, yes. I think Samson, so much has been so much has been given that it will take yeah. us some to. I know, I know. That's how it is. In America, there is a saying, it is like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantastic presentation, but I must say, I am yes. amazed. Yes. So what we study in one semester in the <laughs> theological seminary, <laughs> he was trying to give it in one hour. <laughs> I was thinking I am. Um, I was sitting in a theological yes. classroom. <laughs> there we study this in one semester. Mm. Oh, that was in much detail. Uh, here I 
I went through this because most of you know the Old Testament, at least parts of it. And so I'm just putting them all together. And, uh, you... I was expecting something different. When I was told that you are a scientist, I was expecting some rocket science and creation. <laughs> Because normally scientists do, do not believe in the existence of God. So I was really, my expectation was entirely different. <laughs> Thank you. But I suppose none of the people who are attending Bible studies are not believe, unbelievers in God, right? <laughs> 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 so those questions, yeah, those questions would be not arise and that would be redundant. <laughs> there may not be any question because it's almost it's like a history. There yeah. is nothing. Yeah, is it clarified? I think. Right. Uh, uh, can you question, please. Please go ahead. Uh, the, uh, in one of the slides, they mentioned that. Uh, uh, Two sons of uh, Jacob were not, you know, having any kingdom. One was Levi and the second was which one? Oh, one was Levi and the other was uh, Joseph. Oh, Joseph. Because okay. Joseph's children, Manasseh and Ephraim, were adopted by correct, uh, correct. Jacob. And so they got a double portion. So you wouldn't see Joseph's name in, one of, in, one, in those tribal allocations. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, my question is, how did uh, brother get so interested in the history of the Old Testament? How do you, how do you go, go about studying all this? Can you throw some guidelines into this? Oh, actually, uh, I wanted to study the Old Testament. I took over two years to study all the, most, most of the books still some books of prophets I have to study and um, I was not really planning a presentation then my son said daddy why don't you make a presentation of this and uh, then you can uh, uh, present it to us so that's when I started making a presentation of course I enjoyed making all that animation in PPT but um, but Basically, what I wanted to go to was not so much the facts. You can get all those facts, but uh, what are the lessons? What are the deep insights? Uh, so for that, um, of course, I, what I do, I log into a number of seminaries. You know, you know, all the classroom lectures are available. I could download them to places like Dallas Theological Seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary. So I've been studying a number of their uh, books, a uh, number of their uh, lessons, and a number of them are Old Testament. And uh, now I've been fi finding more and more websites like the Third Millennium, Third Mill website and so on. So where I could um, go back and restudy and go back and restudy to get more deeper insights. So it's, it's a joy, brother. Um, I, I mean, uh, it's a joy to study God's word, and um, there can be no greater motivation than when children ask, a son asks for a presentation. What could be a greater joy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have uh, in our midst. Uh, uh, is Priscilla here, Ch Chef? She was here. I don't okay. know. Okay. Oh, is it? Okay. I don't know if Priscilla uh, would like to come. Oh, yeah, she's there. Yeah. She's there. yeah. <laughs> and uh, we also have among us a very distinguished person by hey. name Chris <laughs> Christine oh, yeah, Lazarus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she. I'm so, she so. <laughs> she represented uh, uh, a Christian community 
uh, in the um, legislative uh, assembly in, uh, of uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, uh, assembly, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. So we're very honored to have you, uh, Christine. Thank uh, you so much, Samson. Yeah. I don't know whether you can hear me or not, but uh, I'm you really can. so very, very interested in the Old Testament. And the right. thing is, I keep wondering, you know, how, how does God forgive so much? That means <laughs> the little things we do, he can forgive us, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> I was just uh, I was just consoling myself. Okay. Yes. Yeah, when he's forgiven so <laughs> much. <huh? laughs> and so many things that are real weird. Yeah, what yeah. I found is that the Old Testament reliefs, uh, reveals so much of the wrongs that have been done. Yeah. Which no other book does. Right. No other Absolute. book. All the human human failings. It was it was just written as it is. No sanitar, no sanitization. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that's what is like you know alarming at times. And they say, my God, this uh, you know the people were really terrible in those days. Well, I said, see, that was human. I said, yeah. so these yeah, are there. I'm, glad. I'm I'm so glad that Shem took this class. It's very yes. nice. I really yeah. liked it. So Shem, you know what? Yeah. Shem, yeah. you know what I liked uh, in your presentation. What uh, really stuck in my heart was the way you uh, showed that it is not about um, redemption, or it is not about uh, escape from bondage. But then God carried us on the eagle's wings yeah. and brought us to Himself. That is that is really really beautiful. I mean, it speaks the heart of God. Yeah. Uh, is that Priscilla there with you? Yeah, this is Priscilla. Uh, Priscilla, come, come, come yeah. Priscilla. You should have yeah, light yeah. on both of you. Uh, uh, now there is Priscilla Shamchandra's wife. My life wife, is bad, very bad. And uh, uh, I know she, why I'm stuck on this. Uh. And she is uh, a medical professional. Uh, and uh, uh, she headed a very important department in uh, the Telangana government and uh, in, the, in the medical uh, uh, department. And uh, uh, let me say one thing. When we went to Sham Chandran's house to study Bible, she was a, a very, very beautiful, wonderful hostess for us. Mm. Uh, yes. uh, we will never forget uh, her hospitality. Thank you, Priscilla. And uh, my friends are there, Hepsiba and Sudhir, the, the uh, very uh, famous advocate. Sudhir, I see that. Yeah, I see that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Welcome. Welcome to all friends. Hi, Christine. Hi, Sudhir. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shem was pretty quiet in the days I used to go to see. See and meet Priscilla and have meetings out there. How she talks. <laughs> I know now I can just about Let me know why I'm quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, true. Hello, yeah. Hello, Shem. Shem. Yeah. Hello. How are you? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know where yeah. I yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, brother. Okay, friends, anybody else uh, who have any questions? Uh, P. John to everyone. My question is, go ahead, brother. Brother Shem, it was nice and wonderful. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Brother Shem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, it was wonderful and beautiful. Thank you. Oh. Uh, where is uh, where is my sister? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Anna. <laughs> Sorry, the light is not. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Good. Thank you, Anna, for spending your uh, precious time. Uh, Good to see you and Shem, and then uh, it's a wonderful time. And then thanks for uh, sharing your uh, thoughts, and uh, we are so very happy. And then uh, uh, God bless you, and Thank God you. God bless uh, Shem for the, his knowledge. Thanks, thanks. And uh, and uh, we are looking forward for the next session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's halfway through. You prepared. Yeah. yeah. I think I think we should start uh, living with the corona, and then <laughs> yeah. meet meet more often. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, of, uh, what? Um, in this case, then, as we've been pleading to the Lord, I mean, I am being praying because I have a book. We all have uh, proposed a word of thanks to uh, Mr. Shem Chandran. Uh, uh, as you could see, he yeah. brings all the perfection and the excellence and the depth of research befitting an IISC and IIT student and a particularly a child and a servant of God who has dedicated 40 years of uh, his time to teach young people in the colleges, in the hostels of medical colleges and uh, engineering colleges, uh, people with a sharp brain who have incisive questions and who are seeking you know, answers to difficult questions. And Shem Chandran has been that in that space. And uh, today we have had the benefit of his summarization of the Old Testament. And then through that, giving us nuggets of gold here and there, uh, gems that he has, uh, uh, you know, uh, mined from his research. So we had a feast and he was the one who did all the hard work. Thank you so much, Shem Chandran, uh, for uh, sharing uh, this precious time and precious resources and your expertise in the subject. Thank you, friends, for Thank joining you. in the Bible study. Let's all give thanks to God for uh, what we have experienced this evening. Shall we pray? And uh, then I would request uh, Pastor Concealan to uh, give us a benediction. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this evening. What a joy it is to read your word, understand your ways, and just stand in awe of your love that has pursued us right from creation to right now in our lives, each one of our lives, and as it will be in the future. We want to thank you for this pursuing love lavished upon us, Help us to respond to you in obedience, even as we see, Lord, a lot of chaos, unrest, and pain all around us. Help us as Christian community to humble ourselves and pray and seek your ways. Repent of our sins so that you may heal our land, O oh Lord. Gracious Father, bind us together with love with cords of love that cannot be broken. And as you have declared, people will know that we are your disciples by the love that we show to one another. And may we show that love to one another. Yes, please. Bless Brother Shem Chandran, Priscilla, and their three wonderful sons. And ask of your blessings upon them. And Lord, continue to use in each of them and the family in a mighty way. We praise you and thank you for St. Paul's Church and for Pastor Concealer and each and every member who has attended and who will see the recording. We ask of your blessings upon them, Lord. Lord, this prayer we pray and ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Shall we all join together in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, in heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for introducing uh, Mr. Sam Chandran to us, and it was a wonderful study. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Mr. Sam Chandran, for Thank your you. knowledge which you have. I'm very sure this will be used here with so many other people also for the extension of God's kingdom. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, yeah. sir. Good, good night. Samson. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you. So, see you next week. And we will discuss yes. the five questions. All right. Thank you. God bless.